This is an everyday view from our living room window. We use screens to isolate ourselves from the outside world because we are afraid. The same way during the war we put papers, rice papers, on windows so we cannot be seen from the outside. But they're not gonna save us. They will perhaps make us a little bit less afraid. This way I decided to make my own windows that protect me from being afraid. We used to cover them for night raids, but also during daytime. And I thought that basically people do that every day. It's not just during war, it's an everyday life. We put a thin layer between us and other people to protect ourselves because we're afraid. We sense fear, angst. We're also afraid to be robbed, to be seen, to be exposed, to be understood, to be interpreted, to be naked, to tell the truth, like the cactus, to do the right thing, to score, to hit the winning point, to do. We are driven by our fears, by our ambitions, which turn into fear. We are afraid. There is always a layer, a thin layer, a membrane between us and others when we want to communicate. It's hard to be quarantined in Alexandria. We love our city. I miss taking my coffee in my favorite coffee shop and when I look at the streets in the morning, how clean and peaceful they are. I say this is a perfect day to go out. The cats and dogs must be saying, where did all the humans go? This is the third week of quarantine. The curfew in Alexandria lasts from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. We are advised not to go out unless it's an emergency. I haven't experienced anything like this before. It's like we ran into a wall. The world is telling us to drop everything that we are doing, to think a little, to give priority to more important things. people being sick and I'm worried about my caretakers at my properties with not having income coming in. How will they survive? What is the world going to look like when we come back from this? When will we come back from this? I know that people come out of these situations stronger and I'm hoping to have some epiphanies <laughs> but for now I'm just trying to stay off Twitter and do something with my hands every day 
check in on my friends and family and just hope things get better. Infatti nel bosco, nel mezzo di un villaggio abbandonato, assistiamo disorientati al dilagare della pandemia. Siamo abituati ad avere troppe certezze. In questo periodo la loro mancanza ci lascia un vuoto, ma allo stesso tempo offre spunti di riflessioni e nuove prospettive. We don't have a home mooring for our narrowboat as we are continual cruisers of the UK canal system. However, due to the travel restrictions that are currently in place in the UK, we're only permitted to travel or move the narrowboat for essential items such as water or diesel. This means that our view out of the window has been rather static of late. We're really lucky on the narrow boat because one side of the boat we usually see towpath and the other side of the boat is usually canal or river. So the views are always quite spectacular or lovely or peaceful or calming. I think we live quite socially isolated anyway. We're off grid. We tend to be quite introverted in how we live anyway. However, the situation we find ourselves in at the moment means that we're also isolated from friends and from family. We're spending a lot more time on the boat and I think what it's done is made us think more about our friendships. Hello. And how to check up on people if you can't see them and just spending a bit more time thinking about kindness and how you can affect other people's mental health by reaching out to them. And um, so that's been something that we've been concentrating on at this time. Since we live in a van, once the school shut down, we had to leave San Francisco. All the libraries was closing and homework was still due. 
Even if people are homeless, people out on the street. And this is the thing right here. This is the thing. This is the thing. People who don't have money, you can't even do nothing. Like, you're stuck. So we out of here. We have been working over the last few years to develop an emergency fund precisely for a situation like this. From the very beginning of van life, we've been preparing ourselves to get out of van life by saving, investing. You should save at least six months, but preferably 12 months and beyond for an emergency fund because you never know. Um, at first we thought we'd only be using a month, but we might be using months and months and months of emergency fund and we're ready for that and i feel like this is like the perfect time for people to save people staying in the house because once you leave and you go outside more than likely you're probably gonna spend some money i feel like we're in the perfect position to bob and weave plan a plan b and plan c we'd have to think of plan c but we can think of plan c probably plan c d and e Father, Javat, say hi. Hi. Uh, 10 gündür evdeyiz. Ee, evden çalışmaya gayret gösteriyoruz. Arkadaşlarım da şirkette. Onlar da evinde çalışıyorlar. Tedbir ama aşkı. Dünya sıkıntılı bir gün dönem işten geçiyor. Ee, bir şekilde iyi de oldu. Bir 10 günlük ailemle beraberim. Hayatımda hiçbir zaman bu zamana kadar 10 gün evden çıkmadan. I'm kind of changed. In a, in, a, in a lot of way, um, I spend much more time with my family, but I, I think differently because I need to say I love you all and I love you with my heart. We do gardening here. We have a garden and we do gardening, we plant uh, vegetables. We live a, um, a vegetarian life, so I think our health is okay, we are okay. But most of my time at home, what I do is to watch this video. When I look out of my window, I see the Berlin Wall Memorial Park. And that park normally is really busy with people, with groups of tourists and Berliners. And these days it's quite empty. There are only a few people going for walk, walking the dogs or doing sports. But this is not a normal day. The whole world is stressed. And I do hope that we, that this is a historical moment when the future changes direction to the better and we with it.
I work from home and there have been moments in the last couple weeks where I think everything is normal. And then I hear an ambulance and then I hear another. And I remember what's going on with the world. And so I worked with my grandfather on his story when I would visit him in Florida and we worked together and he would tell me these stories and when I would go back. I started a chat with friends, friends I haven't seen in like years. Sponge, you know, and, and, and I'm reminded of how important it is to have friends. We might have thousands of followers and friends on Facebook, but now we're seeing how meaningless they are. When he was talking, what matters is the handful of people that make us feel good about ourselves, that we love, that we care about, and that we wish we could hug. And hopefully, when the pause is over, we'll remember that and not go back to just how crazy our lives were and that we will appreciate what we're missing right now to see how quickly that can be taken away. You want to see the view from my back balcony? It's pretty gorgeous. I'm really enjoying it, especially later in the day when there are families playing down there. Just having some breakfast, millet, and a little bit of tea. This is my view from my quarantine. I did a 14-day quarantine in upstate New York. And then I flew back to China and I'm doing a 14 day quarantine here. I'm kind of busy this morning. I gotta do my laundry. Now I'm on my front balcony and I'm really enjoying the view of the river. This is the second time I've done a quarantine and it was without my family both times. So I'm looking forward to the end of this 14 days. Three days from now, they'll come and take the lock off my door, and then hopefully I'll be able to see my kids and my partner. Al principio del confinamiento, estábamos todos como estresados, ¿no? Y poco a poco van pasando los días y, y te vas adaptando a la situación actual. Y por lo tanto, de repente parece que hemos llegado como a una situación de simbiosis con el entorno exterior. ¿no? Al igual que el exterior se vuelve más silencioso, más tranquilo. It's seven degrees outside this morning and it's gonna get to 35. I'm in the solarium of the bio shelter. Look at that nice cow lily. I don't know if you can see it. But you can see things are green and growing even though it was seven degrees um, this morning. And it's starting to get to be 70 degrees, which is seed starting time. But this is south facing. He built it so that those 42 feet of windows can have the heat come in, the passive solar. It heats all this. Think of this as a swimming pool filled with gravel. That's the shallow end down there and it comes, rolls down to the deep end. What happens is the roof is flat and it comes, the water, the rainwater comes through this pipe right down there to that pipe that's coming down by the butterflies and goes into the gravel. All these roots of the, the plant roots clean the rainwater and we run it down through another pipe and then into a water cistern, 5,000 gallons. So we can use that rainwater um, whenever we want to. Bob the Builder, we'll call him, he was an engineer and he had a contract to help build houses in the Arctic in the villages where there's no roads and can't get there except for by air. 
And they wanted flush toilets and running water, just like all the other states. Well, Bob said we could do something easier than have all those pipes that might freeze at 60 below. We could build a house like this. And he gave them their plans, and they said, oh, we can't do that. It's $5,000 extra per house. We can't do that. So Bob said, well, I'm going to demonstrate that it's a great house. So he built one for himself here in Eagle River. So right now, all the villages in the Arctic have flush toilets and pipes that are breaking. And, and really, it costs about $50,000 per house now that things are going wrong. Now I'm excited to give tours to show people, especially in the lower 48, that you can drink your shower water. So the chickens back there, firemen's pull home gyms there, gardens there, the cisterns, main house, behind the main house, the garage where I live. My brother and his family are in the main house. There's the garden. Here's two rainwater tanks to collect water off the main house. See the gutters into those tanks. Provides water for the garden. We've got the compost toilet. Second outdoor shower. Chicken coop. Water harvesting system. Here you go, girls. Yeah, yummy yum, oh yeah. I like to experiment with things that seem common, but use them in maybe uncommon ways, like these oranges, which are um, irrigated just with rainwater and gray water, the water from our household drains that we send to the landscape. But uh, not only is this fruit great, but um, in these days where people are freaking out about lack of toilet paper, we're looking into alternatives. We're here in our outdoor composting toilet, which only costs $300 to build. This is what seems to be running out as people hoard it uh, in the days of uh, the coronavirus. But my preferred is the phone book. And then we've got, here's the orange I just picked, the peels uh, when they're still soft and whatnot, they're like nature's wet wipe. And they leave you with this wonderful citrus scent. And this is a Boudalone Palmeri or Superstition Mallow. They're just these delightfully soft, big leaves. Love to use them in the compost toilet too. <laughs> So here we've got uh, some edible cactus, and it's got both edible fruit, which will come on later, but it's also got these wonderful edible pads. So we just, with a paring knife, will cut off the little buds there, get it nice and smooth, cut it up like string beans, and eat it on up. And so here in our little solar oven, using the free power of the sun to heat it up, uh, I just put in some rice and beans, with that cut up prickly pear pad. What I love is this is not gonna heat up my house. If you look at the streets right now, there's something spiritual about the quietness. people became more calm and understanding. And I think it's because people became aware that they were slave of their work and school or whatever. The pyramid uh, is out there. And suddenly realized that everything should be about survival and realized uh, that being alive is more important than their daily routine and they should uh, appreciate life more. Back in October last year, I lost my job and I decided to use this time off to do something that I wanted to do for a long time, which is 
to go to my cabin in the middle of nowhere and spend some time in the nature. For two months I lived in my cabin. It was such an amazing experience. I was running in the forest. I was jumping into the cold lake. I was reading books and I was far away from distractions and noise of the modern world. Right now, I have a new job and for the past two weeks, I've been working from home. And my home for me right now is here. And I can jump in this cold lake again and I can walk in this forest again. At the same time, I'm actually working from home. I'm not just chilling here, right? The beautiful thing is, I'm managing to produce so much great work results by staying here. There is idea that your best work, usually you can only deliver when you are in the same, the same place, in the same office with your colleagues, with your coworkers. Before, and I kind of agree, is that Work from home, well, if you work in a team, is not as good. The thing is, considering my recent experience here in the cabin, what if I was wrong? What if we were wrong? What if we just didn't try enough? What if we weren't smart enough the approach to work remotely, to work from the places that we love? To work from the places by, uh, when we can avoid commute time and crazy prices and all the stuff. Go, monkey! I'm just here in my kitchen and that uh, loud noise is the pressure canner going off. Um, I'm here trying to do some canning of items, preserving some food, uh, but let's go outside and move away from the whistling noise. This is my window here in Nairobi, Kenya, where I've been living for a decade now, but I've been in East Africa for 15 years in total. Um, because of my asthma and my, you know, my respiratory issues, I don't want to leave my apartment for a very long time. So even though I live in, in an apartment, there are a number of things I'm trying to do to prepare for not being able to leave the house for an extended period of time. So I did live in another apartment for 10 years, which I had named the fifth floor farm. All my waste from the house come either to my earthworms or they come to this chicken coop. So in this chicken coop, we put things like um, sawdust and paper shreds and carton box and plant debris and, and things like that. And these chickens scratch, scratch, scratch all the ways down and they add their little nitrogen deposits. Thank you, chicken. Then their compost that they scratch down come into these bags where we add a few handfuls of worms and we tie them off and we leave them in the corner. And then what we have as a result is this wonderful, rich, amazingly smelling compost that now can go onto the pots where I grow all kinds of different food from bananas and we've got this papaya tree you know I get eggs from these chickens so that's the source of food so in my apartment as soon as I came back from Burundi uh, the first things I did was to plant out my balcony garden with especially high micronutrient leafy green vegetables so at the very least I could munch on some amaranth leaves and get some micronutrients but I'm also canning I do receive an organic basket every week of vegetables, so I'm trying to stretch those as much as possible. Then I also do vermicomposting at home, so I have a small storage room and it's full of bins of earthworms. So I try to create a circular economy of energy in my apartments. And then on top of that, yeah, as soon as I got home, started boiling straw and packing some buckets with holes to pour my grain spawn in to start growing mushrooms. I mean, there's a whole slew of things I've been doing to prepare. Because of my respiratory situation, I do feel vulnerable and very at risk. So I'm prepared to not leave here for months, if that's what it takes. And 
I do believe that this pandemic, it's been so prolific because of ecological collapse. And we as humans don't have the capacity to really understand the delicate interconnectedness and the, the interrelationships of all the things that are part of our living planet. I keep thinking about this story I read about this older priest in Italy who gave up his ventilator to a younger man and this older priest died and it's tragic It's not just about the coronavirus because the fact is so many people die every single day because they don't have access to doctors or things such as antibiotics. They sometimes die of a simple infection and it's so unnecessary. It's, it's just not right. And I can't help but feel helpless and powerless. I think this pandemic is in a way connecting us all. But I just hope that it will bring out the best in humanity. Pine and